So how's everyone's morning this morning? Pretty good? Cool. Wow. Some of you have really good mornings. Um, I had an odd morning. Can I be honest with you guys? I had a weird start to the morning. So Sundays are... Sundays are early days uh, for, for me, so I'm usually here before, you know, at six, maybe a little bit before, but I'm here early. And, and last night, or yesterday, we had rented out the space to a preschooler's birthday party. And let me tell you, it was a rager, all right? So, uh, and I'm not even like kidding, they, they had a LED, uh, I don't know why I said that so slow, LED, LED dance floor uh, for preschoolers. <laughs> I've never had an LED dance floor for any birthday that I've had. They had bounce houses, LED dance floor. I mean, it was, they went all out. So I came here this morning to just like put things back together a little bit. And that included moving uh, those banners in the back. Now, the two smaller banners, uh, I can move on my own. I've done it on my own. It's not really a problem because they're, they're pretty light. But today I decided, you know what, I don't have any help, so I'm going to try and move that 20-foot wide by 12-foot high banner, that one in the middle. I'm going to try and move that by myself. And uh, I thought, you know, I drank my coffee. I worked out this week. I can do this. And so I start moving this banner, and all of a sudden it starts tilting towards me. And, and who here knows that if it's you versus gravity, gravity's going to win every single time. And so I, I, I was in this predicament where I had to decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to try and, like, force this banner to stay up and try and like fight against gravity or do I just like let this thing fall on top of me and just hope for the best possible outcome because I thought if I try and enforce it these things are flimsy like they could break and I was like I might make it worse by trying to force this to happen and so instead I decided I'm just going to drop to the ground and let this banner fall on top of me and fingers crossed that I survived to tell a tale well I did but it was, it was a moment. I was glad no one was here because if you would have walked in, you would have just saw my legs dangling outside the, the banner. And, and so as I'm lying underneath this banner contemplating how my life got to this point, I, I felt like God speak to me in this moment. Does God ever speak to you in weird moments? He, he speaks to me in, in weird moments a lot of times. It's how he gets my attention, I think. And, and as I was laying there with this banner on top of me going like, okay, I think we're good. Now I need to like get myself out of here a little bit. I just felt like God was reminding me that for, for a lot of us over the last few weeks, we've kind of, in a much more serious and more difficult way, we've been doing the same thing that happened to me this morning. And that is as we've talked about anxiety and depression and worry and fear and our triggers and all these things that are really heavy and really hard and really difficult, that, that we feel this weight on us and it feels like it's about to crush us and we are sort of presented with the same two options. Do I resist it? Do I fight it? Do I try and force my way over it or through it? Do I fight back? And, and chances are, and you've maybe found this out, that you can try to do that, but oftentimes you sometimes make things worse by doing it. And, and sometimes the best thing to do when you're experiencing worry and grief and, and anxiety or depression or just the weight of life, sometimes I've found the best solution is to simply just acknowledge his presence in your life and allow it to fall on you for a moment. To allow it to have that presence in your life for a moment. And, and here's the good news. While I was alone underneath that banner trying to figure out how I was going to get out, uh, you're not alone under whatever you're underneath. That God is with you and I can assure you that while the weight of whatever it is you've been carrying that might be falling on you right now in this moment or in this season of your life, I can assure you, and it's hard to hear right now, but let me just speak it over your life, that while it might feel like you're trapped under this forever and never going to get out, my friend, I want to encourage you, not only will you get out of whatever it is you're underneath, but you will come out of it stronger than you were before. Can I get an amen on that? So I, I believe that's why we're doing this series, because we're not content just settling for life underneath the weight of our anxiety, depression, and fear, and troubles, and worries. Like, we're not okay with just living that life. In fact, Jesus isn't okay with you settling for that life. Jesus, he, he acknowledges you will have troubles in this life, but he does promise us that there is a version of life available to us all that even in the midst of troubles, you do not have to live your life troubled. That even in the midst of pain, you can have a peace that rises above your pain, rises above your circumstances. It doesn't diminish the reality of them, but you can cling to a greater reality, that re kingdom reality, even in spite of brutal earthly realities. Are you with me? And that's what this series is all about. It's about acknowledging the presence of those things that are weighing us down, but refusing to be crushed by them. 
and trusting that God will get us out from underneath it all better than how we were before. So can we pause? Can we pray? And we're going to do a weird thing. Maybe you've been fighting it. You're like, oh, I don't want to feel this. I don't want to acknowledge this, this, this weight in my life. What if right now we just like stopped fighting? You just allowed whatever is going on in your life, whatever weight you might be feeling, to just sort of have, a, have its moment in your life, to allow its presence there, but then let's open our heart and ask God to bring us peace in the midst of it. Let's pause. God, right now, we just thank you. We thank you that you are good even when life isn't. You are great even when life isn't. And you are with us in every single moment. You are with us when we feel like we're buried underneath the rubble of life. You meet us in those dark places and broken places. And thank God you don't leave us there. But in your grace and your goodness and your kindness, you, you lead us out of it. And you lead us out of it stronger than how we were before we entered into that moment. So God, we're trusting on that. We're banking on your goodness right now. So this morning, I pray that you would speak to us right where we are and, and give us that incomprehensible peace that you say is actually available to us, regardless of our circumstances. Um, we have troubles, but we don't want to live our lives troubled. And we know that that is possible in you. We ask this on oh, one thing. Jesus, thank you for the 10 and 2 start of the Golden State Warriors. May it continue. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So... I don't know if you've ever met my wife, Jenna. I'm biased, but I think you're pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, we can show her some love, yeah. Um, but we're also very different, right? We're very, very, very different. Why you say, oh, no, don't you trust me? All right, so we're very, very different. You know that rule, that, that whole law of attraction, opposites attract, we always say that. Well, it definitely is true for me and Jenna. Jenna and I could not, and so many, we have some things that are similar, but we also have a lot of things that we're very, very different in. So, um, you know, for example, like going back to the banners, Jenna would have not even attempted to move the 20-foot banner um, because she's smart, all right? And, and, and I have lapses of judgment like that. She wouldn't have even tried to do that. Jenna and I are different because Jenna, if you know her, she's so gracious, she's so merciful, um, and, and, and I'm not saying I don't have those characteristics, but I got to work on it a little bit more. Anybody else with me? Jenna's, it just oozes out of her. For me, I, I just really have to work on it. Jenna is able to fill a room with joy. Any room that she walks in, she just fills it with joy and love, even if she doesn't know anybody in the room. And, uh, and I'm the awkward guy in the room eating like the cheese and crackers in the corner alone. Anybody? Okay. Um, so, so Jenna and I were very, Jenna is a Phoenix Suns fan. Nobody's perfect. You're the only one. You're the only one cheering. You're alone. So, um, but me, I, I am a follower of Jesus. I cheer for the Golden State Warriors. Um, but one thing that is true um, is that, and Jenna would, I think, acknowledge this. You would acknowledge this. I hope, or this is gonna be awkward. But I would say you and I have a very different threshold for pain. Like I have a, a bit of a higher tolerance for pain than, than you do. Like a, a couple nights ago, Finley threw a book up into her bunk bed and it hit you on the leg. And you would have thought Finley threw a grenade because Jenna was like, oh, my leg. And, and it, was, it was cute. Um, I, I tend to have a little bit higher threshold for pain. And it's not because I'm tough. Don't think I'm standing up here and be like, I'm so tough. I'm not tough. It's actually the opposite. I've just done a lot of dumb things that have gotten me hurt. And as a result, my threshold for pain is a little bit higher. Uh, when I was in junior high, I, or I'm sorry, this was actually high school. I wish it was junior high. It made me feel better. This was high school when I should have known better. I tried doing a stunt that I saw on a very popular TV show on MTV. And I tried to do this stunt. And I ended up in the bottom kid you not, at the bottom of an empty dumpster with a broken arm. I snapped my humerus uh, in half at the bottom of this dumpster. And, and, and it's kind of ironic. I, try, I broke my humerus trying to be humorous, and, but it wasn't very funny at all. And so I, I, I built a little bit of a threshold for pain playing basketball. I, I've broken a few fingers. You get knocked in the face a little bit. Like it builds a little threshold for pain. In junior high, uh, a, a popular movie came out called uh, Fight Club. Anybody remember Fight Club? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, you really like that movie. That's awesome. Um, uh, 
Uh, but, but chances are probably because it was Brad Pitt was in that movie. And, and when you were a junior high boy watching Fight Club, you're just like, oh, I want to be re- yoked like Brad Pitt. You know, I want to be ripped like him. And so I remember my junior high friends and I, we started our own junior high fight club after junior high. And we would go and we would bare fist box. These junior hires bare fist boxing with one another. And then I, I came home with my face rearranged. I looked like Hunchback of Notre Dame, like with my eye all messed up. And my mom grounded me from, from Fight Club. And so, but through one decision after another, I've, I've sort of grown a little bit of a higher tolerance for pain. And some of you are like, why are we talking about this? What does this have to do with my life? Peace being triggered and all of that. What it has to do is almost like with everything, actually, that if you are going to have the unshakable peace that I'm talking about, you are going to have to have a high tolerance to pain. Like if you are going to have this unshakable peace that rises above your circumstances, that rises above the situations in your life, you are almost going to have to accept and grow accustomed to feeling some pain and standing in your pain. How about that for a happy Sunday message? Does everyone feel good about life? But we need to talk about this. I think this message is so important that if you will believe it and activate it in your life, that it has the capacity to make your faith bulletproof. Because while you have faith, you will still have struggles. And while you believe in God, you will still have battles. And while you trust that God is in control, you will still have moments in your life where it feels like God is completely out of control and you're wondering where is God in it all? If you want to have the peace that goes beyond understanding, you're going to have to learn how to stand in your pain and to stand in your pain well. It's interesting that as you get older, we learn that that life and pain are sort of inseparable, aren't they? That you don't really get a a, a version of life without pain at times. At least if you have a life without pain, you either have not lived long enough or you have not loved well enough or loved boldly or lived boldly enough. Because if you love well and you live boldly, you will experience pain in this life. It is an unavoidable reality that Jesus does not mince words about. He says, you will be troubled, but fear not. For I have overcome the world. There's something about life that, and pain that are inseparable. And, and this, doesn't become, this becomes so clear when you witness the birth of a child. There's something about the birth of a child that brings to life this reality I'm talking about, that, that life and new life is also messy and comes on the other side of labor and pain and struggle. It makes you wonder if sometimes God gives us these smaller pictures to point us to the bigger ones. That that, that as we look at the moment where a a, a woman gives birth to a child, it's beautiful as they give birth to new life, and yet it can only happen through immense labor and immense pain and struggle. Labor and life, they go hand in hand. And the reason you need to know this is because there might be some things that God is trying to birth in your life. He's trying to birth a higher level of character. He's trying to birth a new passion. He's trying to birth a new identity. Maybe he's trying to birth healing and hope. I don't know what God is trying to bring out of your life, but I do know this, that the most beautiful moments in your life will likely come after your fiercest battles. They will often come after those most difficult and excruciating moments that you walk through, labor and life go hand in hand. And so if you are going to have this peace that, that, that can withstand an age of anxiety, then we're gonna have to learn how to stand in our pain because you will never accidentally um, achieve peace. That's just not how it works. You won't w- wake up one day and go like, oh my gosh, I think I, think I, I have peace now. You won't stumble into it. And I'm not talking about happiness or joy. You will have those moments of joy and happiness. Like, you will, but I'm talking about peace. I'm talking about something that transcends circumstance. And if you want a peace that transcends circumstance, you're not only going to need to learn to stand in your pain, but you're going to have to embrace the irony, and that is that peace rarely comes peacefully. That you will have to fight for it if you want to achieve it in your life. If you are to achieve inner peace, You will need to learn how to wear your wounds well. 
If you want to achieve inner peace, you will need to learn that just like in every book and in every movie, that in the plot line of your life, there is no character development without conflict. That conflict is a necessary, essential ingredient to the development of who you become. If you want to have inner peace, you're going to need to embrace that you will need to not hide your scars. Jesus didn't hide his, neither should you. If you're going to achieve inner peace, you're going to have to know that you're going to have to fight for it. It will not come on accident that you will have to engage in a battle if you are going to achieve inner peace. And see, this is so important. Because this sermon might save your faith 20 years from now. If you remember it and internalize it, because there's going to be moments in your faith, I guarantee it, you've probably already had it and you've known people who have, and that is there are gonna be moments where you want to believe in God, but you're wondering where God is in your pain. Has anybody ever wondered where God is in their pain? Have you ever been like, God, where were you when I was alone? Where were you when I was abandoned? God, where were you in that miscarriage? God, where were you in that, can- that, that cancer diagnosis? God, where were you in the divorce? God, where were you in my depression? God, where were you when I, when I was betrayed? God, where, where were you in my pain? There will be moments, many, that you ask that question. And the future of your faith depends on what we're talking about today, your ability to stand in your pain because scripture, unfortunately, I'm gonna title this, this teaching the problematic reality about peace. It's problematic because it's hard. And it's hard because of this from the front of the Bible to the back of the Bible and with every teaching of Jesus. At no point in time does Jesus or any author in the scripture say, hey, here's a way around your pain. There is never a point where they say, hey, there's a version of life. You could take a divine detour over, around, or under your pain, but that is not what we get. Instead, the scriptures assure us you will have pain, and Jesus teaches that he is not here to lead you around it, but to lead you the only way you can go, and that is through it. So how do we do that? So that your faith is standing on the other side, and you have peace in the middle of the battle. And see, I think we've all asked that question, where's God in my pain? Where's God in the struggles of my life? In fact, I, I think that's why we have some of the books in the Bible that we have in particular, one that I wanna look at today, a mysterious book, a book that if you love happy endings, you're not gonna love this book. But it's in the Bible, and I think for a reason. It's the book of Job. It's an extremely mysterious book, but it's curious to me that this particular story has lasted for thousands and thousands of years. It has, it has lasted through generations and through uh, uh, cultures. And, and even today, we still wrestle with this mysterious book in the Hebrew scriptures called the book of Job. Now, you may not be familiar with the story of Job, but let me give you sort of the, the, the Reader's Digest version of it. You have a righteous man who is named Job. And all of a sudden in this sort of what we get is this heavenly council that's taking place. All of a sudden a character called the Satan, also known as the accuser, the Satan steps out of all the council and approaches God and says, Job only trusts you because he has everything. He only trusts you because life is easy. He only trusts you because he has wealth, he has health, he has a great family. But take all those things away and watch his trust in you completely diminish and crumble. And God says, let's put it to the test. And so God releases the Satan. And in this story, we see the Satan brings trial upon trial upon trial on the life of Job. We see that in in just a short matter of time, Job loses his kids. They're killed. And then he loses his, all his wealth is taken away from him. And then at the end, his health is even taken away from him. In just a short moment of time, he loses his family, his wealth, and his health. And not only that, but after all of this, we see Job's wife show up and she actually begins to tell Job, hey, you should just curse God. God God has clearly cursed you. You need to just curse God and get it over with. And then Job, according to the story, has a group of friends that show up. And these group of friends, you would think they would show up and comfort and be there for their friend Job. But instead they show up and they go, Job, the only logical explanation for you going through what you've gone through is because you must be a pretty terrible person. That you must have some things, some secrets, some sin in your life that you haven't confessed. And so God is obviously punishing you uh, because of something you've done. You need to repent. You, you really probably deserve what you're getting. Talk about getting kicked. 
while you're down. And so you have this mysterious story about this incredibly difficult situation and, and moment in the life of Job, which is always so funny at times because believe it or not, I sometimes have people as a pastor over the past 17 years who will approach me and be like, you know, they'll go through something in their life. They'll be like, oh, my boyfriend or, or my girlfriend broke up with me. Now I get what Job must have felt like. Or like, I got a parking ticket. Now I know the plight that Job had to endure. And, and I think it's safe to say probably none of us in this room, I hope, have ever experienced that level of pain, trauma, and loss that Job had to endure. But I don't think that's the point. I don't think we have this mysterious book of Job so that we can compare our pain to Job and be like, well, it's not as bad as him, and then we go on. No, I, I actually don't think that's the point. In fact, we could have another conversation another day whether the story of Job is allegory, it's a story pointing to a bigger story, or whether it's historical, like fact, like there was a real guy named Job and this all really happened. That's another story for another day. But here's my bottom line conviction on the book of Job. I think, the, I think we have this story because this story tells us something about life and how to navigate those moments where you have pain and you have experiences and loss and you have no explanation for it. You have no understanding as to why this happened and how do we have peace when we find ourselves in that level of struggle. And so Job, in Job 1, loses everything. Then Job chapter 2 through 37 is this battle uh, in sort of Job's relationships in his own heart. I mean, there's some days, and maybe you can relate, there's some days Job is like, God, I trust you. You're good. This is awful, but you're good. And then there's like another day Job's like, God, what is your deal? How have you abandoned me? I wish I would have just died when I was born so I would have never experienced any of this. Like, can anybody relate to those those? Uh, swinging reactions, those, those polarizations, those feelings that you have, like that's where Job is at. And then finally in Job chapter 37, in Job chapter 37, Job does what again, I think probably all of us at some point have done. Job approaches God and he says, I demand an explanation. You owe me an explanation, God, as to why I lost my kids, why I lost my wealth, why I lost my health. You owe me this, God. And it's in Job chapter 38. That God responds. And I'm just going to warn you. Jenna and I talked about this week. She's like, I don't like that. You're probably not going to like God's response. But there's a point at the end of it all, and I'm going to ask you, will you hang with me? Because we'll get to the point, even if what God says at the beginning feels a little brash or very brash. Here's what God says in John, or I'm sorry, Job chapter 38, verse 1. It says, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this? that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words. Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Ooh. So Job is like, all right, God, you owe me an explanation. And God's like, oh, okay, are we doing this? Put on your cup. We're about to go to work. And here's what God does next. Over the next few verses, God takes Job on this sort of virtual tour of the universe, and God begins to ask Job to, he said, you want me to explain this? I want you to explain how the cosmos and the universe and all creation and its intricacies and complexities, explain to me how all of those things came into existence. Because I was there at the beginning, were you, Job? I didn't see you at the beginning of all things that were made, but I was there. Oh, Job, you want to run things? I'll give you a day and let's see how you do. And then God responds even further, and he introduces Job to two beasts. We don't know what these beasts are, really, but God, he brings to his attention these two beasts, and God begins to brag about how powerful these beasts are, how these beasts could demolish anything or anyone in its way. And God seems to suggest that even these beasts are a part of God's good creation. And then, that's it. That's God's whole defense to Job. It's really weird. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's really weird. I'm saying what you're probably already thinking. Like, what was that all about? Job loses so much, says, defend yourself, God. And God says, no, first, you need to explain all the complexities of the universe. Here's what seems to be going on. From Job's point of view, it didn't appear that God was being just. 
But God replies by saying that his perspective, his understanding of the world and all the complexities of it all is infinitely bigger than Job's perspective. Even in Job's most alert, caffeinated moment, it pales in comparison to what God sees. While Job only sees a moment, God says, I'm, inter I'm intimately interacting with every single detail about the universe now and in the future. And I see how it all works together. And I see what happens when this domino falls or when this domino falls. And what God calls this is wisdom. The ability to see how everything works and what the exact right decision is at the right time, whether or not we see it ourselves or not. And so this leaves Job in his place of humility, a place where he has to, how do I respond to this? And here's what Job says after God's reply. It says, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I, I knew nothing about things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. Which by the way, this is a really powerful moment here that I think is worth bringing into our lives here and now. And that is, as a pastor over the years, what I've learned is that there's a lot of people that they have what I call secondhand faith. You have faith because you were raised by Christians or your grandparents were Christians or you went to church your whole life. And so you're like, why do you believe? And you don't really have a substantive answer for it. It's just like, well, that's, this is just kind of what I've always done. This is just sort of more of a tradition. What at best I would call that secondhand faith. And the issue with Job, what he discovered is secondhand faith was not going to get him through this firsthand storm. And there's a lot of times that for many of us, we're going through a firsthand storm and now our secondhand faith isn't enough to get you through it to the other side. And if you're going to get through a firsthand storm, you're going to need firsthand faith. And this is what Job says. He's like, I've, I, I, I've only heard about you before. I, I've only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. Oh, I pray for all of you that you would have a firsthand faith because it's the only way to stand in your pain in the midst of life struggles. In verse six, he says, I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. So not only did Job humble himself, but here's what's so interesting and will drive some of you nuts. At the end of the entire book of Job, Job never gets an explanation for why he suffered. The story just ends. And there is no, well, here's why I did this, Job. Sorry, we had that little tense back and forth, but let me explain the reason behind everything you've had to endure. There's none of that. Job gets zero explanation or zero understanding as to why he went through what he went through. And yet, at the end of the story, we see a man in Job who was able to live at peace even without understanding. When he was fighting for control, he was without peace. When he was demanding God to give him answers and explanations and to tell him why, he was not at peace. But when he crossed this line and said, God, you are God, I am not. You are greater than I will ever be in my best moment. You know more than I will ever know in my best moment. You are truly wise, truly sovereign, truly in control. I am not. Then that is when Job had peace. It's the irony of peace. It's the illusion of peace that many of us have, that we believe I will have peace when I have control. But who here knows that if you even have control for a moment, you can lose it in the next. I don't want a peace that can just go from one moment to the next. I want a peace that will withstand every moment. And peace is not found when you have control. Peace is found when you no longer need it. Peace is found when you no longer live your life trying to get control, but instead trust a God who is. But see, the story doesn't end there. Because we're told that Job gets back double everything that he lost. And I don't know about you, but I used to read this story and assume, well, okay, he was being rewarded for enduring this like elaborate, dramatic test. But actually, that's not the case. He doesn't get back everything double because of some sort of reward. Because God makes it clear earlier that he wasn't being punished because he did something wrong. So instead, why does Job get everything back double in the end? The story doesn't answer the question. 
it just leaves us with a cliffhanger. It's almost like the author is saying, oh, you don't understand this, do you? And the reader goes, I have no idea. And the author is saying, that's sort of the point. That there are going to be moments in our lives where God will do this or do that, and we do not know why. We do not have an explanation. We do not have understanding. And what we learn from Job is that if we can trust the sovereignty and goodness and power of God, there is a version of life that even when we don't have understanding, we can still have peace. Why would this story last so long? I'm curious about that. And I'm sure we can have a lot of different answers, but what I found to be the most compelling answer to that question, why did Job survive this long? And by the way, you may not know this, Job is actually the oldest book in the entire Bible. It's the oldest book. And some, according to rabbinical tradition, believe that the reason that the book of Job was written first, the reason it's the first book of all the books of the scriptures, is because the book of Job is almost like God's parental advisory sticker on the cover of the album. It's like God saying, before we get started, you should just know something up front. Life's going to be hard. Before we get rolling, you should know you're going to have suffering, you're going to have pain, and there's going to be moments where you're like, I do not understand why this is happening And we have the book of Job not only to warn us, but also to invite us into a reality that if you can trust God, even when you don't understand God, that you will in that moment find a peace that goes beyond your circumstance because your peace is no longer anchored to your circumstance. Your peace is now anchored to your God. That your peace is anchored to the goodness and greatness of God. Now that understanding makes a lot of sense why we have this very old book, Job, and why It was given to us first. And it makes sense then why throughout the scriptures and other wisdom literature, like in the book of Proverbs chapter three, the author writes this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And can we read this next line out loud together? And lean not on your own understanding. Why did the author tell us not to lean on our own understanding? Because there's gonna be moments we don't understand what's going on. And there's gonna be moments that we're like, I have no clue. Don't know why this is happening. And it's in that moment, we're going to lean on something. None of us get to avoid leaning on on anything. All of us lean on something. And the author's going, will you lean on your understanding or will you lean on God's? Because there are going to be moments you just simply do not have a linear answer for. And this is why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 11, he says this, Oh, great are, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. And all oh, my control freaks, that's your least favorite verse in the Bible, right? Like, it's impossible. And this is a guy who wrote three quarters of the New Testament. A person who witnessed the presence of God on the road. This is a person who would give his life to the cause of Jesus. And yet he even says, there's going to be things you don't understand. There are going to be things that as hard as you try, it will be impossible for you to ever know why that thing happened. See, that tells us something that's so true about peace that's hard to believe or accept, but I believe it's true with everything that's in me, and will, it will make you unshakable in this life if you can get it. And that is that inner peace, at least according to Jesus, inner peace is achieved through trusting, not understanding. Like inner peace in your life is achieved not through understanding, but through trusting. And I wonder how many of you are losing the battle to peace and you're losing because you're spending all your energy trying to understand why this is happening, why this is happening or why it happened that you're losing ground on the war for peace inside of you because you are so committed and fixated on trying to get clarity on your why instead of giving all that energy and commitment to the who, to Jesus, to your Savior, to your Messiah. What is it that you're trying to understand that God is saying, hey, I just need you to trust me on this? What is the battle that you're trying to find clarity on the why and God is saying, can you trust the who? Maybe you're trying to understand why, why, why another miscarriage? Why, God, I don't understand. And I wonder if God is saying, can you trust me even in this? 
Maybe some of you are going, why the divorce? I don't understand. And I wonder if God is saying, I wonder, can you trust me in this? Why is the depression still here? Why did I go through that loss? Why did that person that I love, that I prayed for, die because of cancer? Why did that relationship end? Why am I still struggling in this way? I wonder if many of us, we have not found peace because you're obsessed with why. And God is saying, I need you to trust the who. I need you to trust that there are things you don't understand and there are things that you do not see and there are things that even if I tried to explain it to you, you still wouldn't understand it. But I'm here with you. I'm here for you and I'm walking in this battle through it with you. You are not alone. Can you trust me? Oh, I know it's not practical. I know so many of these series, it's like, here's five steps for this and three steps for this. I have one step for you today. Trust your who instead of obsessing about the why. And I know it's hard and I know it's not very practical, but I do know this. If you can do it, you will have inner peace. There are plenty of things in my life. I wish God would give me a PowerPoint presentation and tell me exactly why it happened. That has not been dropped in my inbox yet. And so I'm still at this place of saying, God, I have to trust you even though I don't understand you. And by the way, both of those things can coexist. Don't let anybody tell you that, that if, you don't, if you have doubts or struggles that you, your faith is shook or weak. No, 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 no. I think there's this tension of like, God, I don't understand you. If real faith, actually, I don't understand you, but I trust you. I don't understand why this happened, but I trust you. I want to give you this question. We'll end with this. The band can come up. A pastor named Francis Chan asked this question, and it shook me to my core, and it called out my pride and my ego, and it's a question I hate asking but need to ask, and I bet some of us in this room need to ask it as well. Here you go. This is such a big faith question. Can you worship a God who isn't obligated to explain himself to you? Can you worship a God who is not obligated to explain his actions to you? that will really call out where you are in the faith stuff. And it's a hard one. And maybe you're here and you're like, Travis, I don't know if I'm there yet. That's okay. That's okay. But if you're here and you're like, I want to follow Jesus with my life, this is a question you will not have to ask once or twice, but probably many times. Can you continue to trust and worship a God who is not obligated to explain his actions to you? Say, my hope and why we have to have this talk is that you will see that while life is full of troubles, you don't have to be troubled. And while life is full of pain, you can still have peace. But I also feel it would be an injustice for me to stand up here and tell you that you will always understand why things happen. There will be things in your life that you experience and you may never get an answer on this side of heaven. But you can still trust God in that space. You can anchor yourself to Jesus. And you may never get clarity on your why, but you'll be able to make it if you've anchored yourself to your who, to Jesus, your Messiah, your Savior, your King, your Lord. And when we do that, you become unstoppable and your peace becomes unshakable.